This morning, as you know, is Palm Sunday, as was so wondrously demonstrated by our children. Some of them were really excited to wave those palms, and some weren't sure, but they're still giving us the idea that it's Palm Sunday. It's the day that's taken from the Gospels, giving us the account of the grand entrance of Jesus. A whole city threw a parade for Jesus. The difference in this parade, in a parade as we know it, is that this parade had only one uh, major float that was its main attraction, and that was the entrance of Jesus. And as he rode into the city, the people were throwing palm branches in anticipation of his coming. And this day marked a time of celebration where he was worshipped, he was praised, the crowd was stirred. As I have been thinking about this message this week and Leading up to it, I've been struck by the fact that the importance of this day and this celebration sometimes goes unnoticed. We know that it's Palm Sunday. We get that. We celebrate it. But the significance isn't really grasped, I don't think. And I've been struck by the fact that even if it is, if we know the importance that we kind of forget or we just maybe take it for granted, and I think sometimes... We get to Palm Sunday with, and we take this approach of sort of, wow, it's Palm Sunday already. Can you believe next week's Easter? And then we sort of go into this motion of, oh, what we've got to do to get ready for Easter. And we forget really what this day marked. And this day, this entrance, this celebration marks the beginning of Holy Week. And if you think about Holy Week, what that means, Palm Sunday begins Holy Week. It leads to the death of Christ on the cross on Friday that leads us to resurrection on Sunday so that we can have Easter, so that we can celebrate. But this day is bittersweet because even as we celebrate his arrival and many in the crowd are shouting, Hosanna, the cross is coming. And yet so many in the crowd, these same people will shout Hosanna today and in just a few short days they'll be lining the path to the cross and they'll be shouting crucify him, crucify him. And the thought of this, the image of this, it causes me to wonder. I wonder how often I praise him and worship him and I anticipate his presence in my life or in our service or in my devotions or I long to be with him. And when something doesn't go my way, I turn right around and I'm like one of these folks. And just a few days later, I'm shouting, with, whether with my voice or with my actions, in anger, crucify him. And I forget that I was just praising him. Our humanity, our flesh creates this response. We forget. So today I want to look at what I've entitled the paradox of Palm Sunday. Do you know what a paradox is? A paradox is a true statement that at first it kind of appears contradictory. Para means contrary and doxa means opinion. So a paradox deals with contrary opinions or ideas which are seemingly so opposite. They can't both be true, but in fact they are true. In other words, they sound contradictory, but really they complement each other. For example, we use things like the more you know, the, the more you learn, the less you know or less is more. And the purpose of a paradox is to arrest us or to capture our attention and provoke fresh thought, which is what I really hope to do today is to provoke fresh thought about Palm Sunday. A day that, again, we might otherwise sort of yawn our way through. It's just another Sunday. Maybe we didn't get up this morning and think about going to church and it's Palm Sunday and the essence of it and the significance of it. We just thought, okay, I've got to get up and go to church. And we, again, are just maybe going through the motions. Christianity is filled with paradoxes. The rich beggar. From death comes life. We're in the world but not of the world. Or he who seeks his life will lose it. Or whatever I have gained in life I count as loss. And you pursue God but he is pursuing you. And what about the paradox of Palm Sunday? For example, again, it's not like any other parade. Because in this parade, the Almighty King is riding to his death. And not only is he an Almighty King, but he's also a humble King. And that humble King is commanding our praise. And so what can we learn about Jesus? What can we learn about ourselves? As far as we know, it was the only time, Palm Sunday was the only time as an adult that Jesus hitched a ride on something other than a boat. He walked most everywhere. And this might not be really a big deal or seem like a big deal. Okay, so he didn't ride a boat. He didn't walk. 
But what this event does is draws our attention to the way he acquired his mode of transportation. Instead of walking into Jerusalem as he had done a dozen times before, he deliberately paused a couple of miles outside the city and directed two of his disciples to go fetch a donkey colt for him. It wasn't that he was tired and he wanted to ride the last couple of miles. Nope. He had less than a week to live. And he knows that. He's fully aware. And he's finally decided to make it known publicly that he is the long-awaited Messiah, the king that God's people had been waiting for for hundreds of years. And in Zechariah 9.9, there was a foretelling, the prophecy of the fact that the king would come into the city riding on a colt. And Zechariah predicted it would happen 500 years before Jesus was even born. So the time would come. Jesus was ready to take the next step. So we'll look at our text this morning in Matthew 21. This is written about in the Gospels in Matthew and Luke and all the others. But we'll use Matthew 21 this morning. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethpage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you're doing, just say, the Lord needs them and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus came donkey and the colt to him. They threw their garments over the colt and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Hosanna, blessed to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. You see, in times of war, the conqueror would ride upon a prancing stallion, but in times of peace, the king would ride upon a colt to symbolize that peace prevailed. And so how would these people respond to that? How do you and I respond to that? Again, if we don't think about it, we don't grasp the significance of it, what is it we're responding to? Would they recognize that his kingdom was not of this world, that it was a spiritual kingdom and he was a spiritual king? Small chance because he'd been teaching them that for three and a half years and they still hadn't listened to it. They still that. Maybe some of them would greet him with laughter. Maybe they would be amused by what Jesus was doing because it's kind of a ridiculous picture. Here's this carpenter who's riding in on a donkey declaring himself to be a king. Others might greet him with anger because they're upset. They would interpret that his riding into the city would be arrogance or blasphemy against God. Maybe there'd be many who would welcome him with joy and welcome him as an earthly king and they'd see him as his coming to establish the throne of David to overthrow the Roman Empire. They were ready. They were eager. They are going to place a crown upon his head. Among the crowd would be people that he had healed. Still others had been among the thousands he had fed. Many more had seen his miracles and listened as he spoke with authority. They had listened to him and their lives had been changed. Much like you and I, when we listen to him, doesn't that change our lives? But again, let me remind you, Jesus knew who was going to be in the crowd. He knew all of this, and he also knew that just over the horizon was the cross, looming like a monster, ready to consume him. And in Luke's account, in chapter 19, in verse 28, Luke writes that in spite of all of that, Jesus still set his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem. He would made up his mind. I don't know about you, but if I've made up my mind to do something, you're not going to get me to change it very easily. Is that the same with you? And here's Jesus. He knew all of this, and yet still he made up his mind to go steadfastly, unwaveringly, with conviction, with determination. He was still going to go, and he knew that they would praise him, and they knew that they would cheer and celebrate He knew they were going to be shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, and yet he knew the cross awaited. And he knew they would turn on him and shout, crucify him. And yet he set his face, his mind, steadfastly with determination. 
I don't know about you, but if I knew that one day a crowd of people loved and cheered for me and a few days later they were going to be against me, I'm not sure I would have been so steadfast, so determined, so convicted to continue on to do that. I mean, when someone is a friend to you or they're super extra nice to you and then they turn their back, I'm not so loyal. I'm kind of hurt. I don't trust them. That's been broken. And I don't want to be around them. And I certainly don't want to be the center of their parade where they're hailing me as Hosanna or important, knowing what they know that in a few days, I mean, I'm sure I'd be holding a grudge and probably bitter. But that's why he's Jesus and I'm not, so we can all breathe a sigh of relief there. But I need to get my attitude in check. I need to keep my mind set. I need to keep learning about how to face those same people because you and I have them in our lives. We have people who are nice to us, say they love us and they care about us, and then something happens, they turn their back on us or they hurt us, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally, but it hurts us. And we need to continue learning from his example. So for Jesus to ride into this Jerusalem on a colt to declare he's a king, he had a specific colt in mind. And he told his disciples exactly where they would find that colt and what they should even say because he even knew the owner was going to ask, what are you doing with my colt? And when the two disciples arrived in town, they found everything just as Jesus had described. And I think this is significant kind of struck me in a different way this week. The fact that Jesus knew these details demonstrates his omniscience. And if you're not aware, omniscience is a big word that we use to describe who Jesus is. It defines, it's defined as, and means it's his divine ability to know all things. Do you see the comfort here? Jesus is omniscient. He knows all things. He has that ability you and I do not. Oh, we like to think we know everything, but we don't. He knows all things. And if he knew that a donkey was waiting in the next town, then he certainly knows what is on the current path that you are walking, and he knows what is on the path down the road, whether it's today or tomorrow or it's six days or six years or six months or six, it doesn't matter. He knows. He knows where you are now, and he knows where you're going to be because he knew what the donkeys were in the next town that he needed for his triumphal entry. You may not know how that medical test is going to turn out, but Jesus does. You may not know how you're going to make ends meet, but Jesus does. You may not know where the job's going to come from, but he's already got it. And he's already planned it. And he's going to wait till the perfect time to open his perfect time. It's not ever in my time. To open that door. And you might not even know how in the world you're going to make it through those most difficult, dark days that you're walking through right now, or that you maybe think are coming, or when they come, or what you've been through. But he knows, and he knows, and he knows, and he knows, because Scripture says he is right here, he is near, he is present, he is an ever-present help in times of trouble. He's our strength, he's our refuge. He knows. If he knows what's in the next town, don't you think he knows what is happening in your life in this moment? Satan would have us believe otherwise. Because if we understand that Jesus knows all things, it gives us confidence to follow him and to follow his direction. But Satan doesn't want us to do that. In these difficult situations when we're waiting for him, Jesus, to show up, Satan wants to create for us doubt and worry and despair and confusion and hopelessness and all of this. But he's got your back. And he's got the front and he's got the sides, and he's above you, and he's below you. And we read about it in Exodus chapter 13 where it says, By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night a pillar of fire to give them light so they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire left its place in front of the people. He and the, and the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire are sort of this manifestation of the presence of who God is. And it says he never left his people. That means he will never leave you or me. He is present in our lives in so many ways. And if Jesus knows about the donkey and he can tell his disciples, he knows about your life. 
At the heart of Palm Sunday is his desire to bring peace into our lives, to be willing to carry the weight of those burdens of whatever you have that is weighing you down. Now that's something to get excited about. At the heart of Palm Sunday is his desire to bring peace, not just into the world, but into your life. This brings incredible hope and comfort. Do you feel it? Can you sense it? He knows it. He knows about you. And we just finished in our women's Bible study the book, It's Not Supposed to Be This Way. When life's disappointments leave you shattered. Because life is hard. It leaves us shattered. And yet, it tells us how it's designed to draw us near to him. That we can trust him. That there's purpose in our pain. You know there was purpose in his pain? And he knew it. When we're going through pain, we don't want to think about the purpose of it. We don't even want to think about the fact that God knows what he's doing and what we're going through. But there's purpose in our pain. And he sent for the donkey anyway, knowing what was coming. And knowing the ultimate, most drastic pain of his life was just five days ahead. The crowd that cheered Jesus as he entered Jerusalem had seen proof of this. The whole crowd of disciples shouting joyfully about the miracles they, see, they had seen. And because of the miracles they had witnessed, the crowd was convinced Jesus was a powerful king worth following. Those who had seen that. And just before he got into Jerusalem, he had healed two blind men in Jericho. Think of how modern medicine has yet to give back anyone their sight. I mean, they can do different kinds of laser surgery and things, but that process might still create maybe a difficulty with night vision or other little things, but you can still see better. But I doubt if the two men in Jericho had any problem with night vision or anything else once they were healed by Jesus. And if you're not impressed with that miracle, then be impressed as the crowds were with the fact that Jesus had just raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. Hello. How do you think? I mean, he did that, and he just simply told the dead man to come out of the tomb, and he did. And it's no wonder Jesus said to Lazarus' sister, I'm the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in me will live even though he dies. Oh, a paradox. Living but dying. You know people were talking about that. What would it be like today in Overland Park or Lewisburg or Gardner or Belton or Kansas City or somewhere, if somebody else raised someone from the dead? I mean, news travels fast, but with social media, I mean, it would go vir viral, like quickly. Jesus is a great king, to be sure. He's an almighty king. He is power over death. I already mentioned this. Here's the first paragraph. Par paradox. This almighty king rode into Jerusalem to die. This was a triumphal entry, but it was the first step for Jesus toward his death. His choice of transportation, this donkey colt, not a white stallion, hinted at this truth. He was not headed into Jerusalem as some tough general who would kick out the dreaded Romans, as many people hoped he would. He meekly, quietly, submissively sat on the back of a donkey, riding into town, knowing he was going to die. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And that song on um, that day is not much unlike the one the angels sang at Jesus' birth. Because at Jesus' birth, suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God, saying, Glory to God in highest, on earth peace to men in whom his favor rests. So the Christmas angels proclaim peace on earth, while the Palm Sunday crowd sang peace in heaven. With Christ's birth, God gave, God's peace came to earth. And now with his approaching death, how is he going to bring peace to heaven? Like the king who surrenders to the enemy so his army can go free, Jesus gave himself up to his heavenly father's justice. And on the cross, Jesus suffered the punishment that we deserve for our sins. On the cross, he was suffered. On the cross, he was beaten. On the cross, he died. He died for my sin and he died for your sin. And this almighty God could have stopped it. 
He could have called 10,000 angels. He could have come down from the cross. He could have done all kinds of things, but he didn't. He went ahead with it, and the Jewish leaders even taunted him. And they said, if you're the Christ, come down from the cross and we'll believe you. Only if you come down will we believe you. How many times do we say, well, only if you'll do this for me, then I will believe it. Only if you'll do that for me. I want it packaged just like this. And if you'll put this gold bow on it in this spot on this day, then I'll know that it's you. We put conditions on whether or not we're going to believe it and, and believe him and believe who he is. And yet he went to the cross and they're saying, if you're God, if you really are, then come down. And he could have come down from that, in a, that cross in a heartbeat, but he didn't because his heart beats for you and me. He thought of how if he didn't suffer and die, we'd have to spend an eternity away from his love. That's not what he wants. He wants us all to be in heaven with him. Jesus came to rule your heart. He wants to take control of your life. He wants to be the Lord of your life. And many of those people on that day weren't interested in a king who was going to come and set up a kingdom in their hearts Sadly, many today aren't interested in that either. We want the king. We want what he's going to do for us. We want him to get us out of a bind here and there. But we don't want him to rule our heart. We don't want his kingdom to truly be in our heart where we have to surrender everything to him. Jesus died to forgive all people, but not everyone will be saved because so many will reject him as their savior. They think they can make it into heaven on their own terms. Like I just said, we don't mind crowning him Lord of our lives or calling him Jesus, uh, calling ourselves a Christian or a follower as long as we don't have to submit to his authority in every day life. Oh, I'll submit to his authority when I need it. But not every single day in every moment. That's the essence of what he's doing here. And that's why these religious leaders were so offended when they heard Jesus' disciples proclaiming him king because they wanted to put a stop to it. They wanted him to say no. And Jesus answered, as we read in Luke 19.40, even if I told the people to be quiet for a moment, the very stones of the ground would cry out. Even the stones, the rocks would cry out. And so this brings us to our second Palm Sunday Paradox, Jesus showed himself to be a humble king who came to serve us by dying on the cross. And this humble king still commands our praise. He didn't tell the, king, the crowd to be silent because they didn't proclaim him king. The stones would still cry out. They could choose that on their own. Philippians 2 teaches us a similar truth. It reminds us if we don't willingly acknowledge Jesus now as Lord and Savior, we'll be forced to do it come judgment day. Because scripture says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But then that forced confession will no longer save us from God's eternal wrath because it's forced at judgment day. It's so much better to do it now, so much better to surrender now, to submit now to his authority and let him set up his kingdom in our heart and rule and reign. Amen. Amen. I ask you this morning, have you acknowledged Jesus as Lord of your life? Do you know he's forgiven your sins and only through faith, through in him that you'll go to heaven? I mean, maybe you've made this confession in your heart and you make it over and over again because we mess up. But do your hands show the commitment that you've made with your heart? Jesus came to serve us by dying on the cross. How are we serving him? The people in the Palm Sunday parade demonstrated their invisible faith when they threw their coats down on the ground for, the, for Jesus' donkey to walk over. These coats weren't rags necessarily, but they did double for some as the only blanket that many people owned. Is that the kind of praise and service that we bring to the king? 
It makes me think of the song, um, um, Heart of Worship, King of Endless Worth. No one could express how much you deserve. Uh, Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours. And that song says, I'll bring you more than a song. And it goes on and says, he's looking into our heart. See, he's concerned about us and our heart. Which is why he's going through with this. Are we eager to sing his hosannas, not caring who hears us? Are we too bashful even about praying in public before we eat a meal? I was somewhere the other day, I don't know where I was, I think I was at Target or something, I was just humming along and singing along. (laughs) Somebody said, you seem pretty happy today. And I was just singing, I mean, I was just singing a worship song, and it was just on my mind, and I could only remember like two sentences, but it was the whole day, that's all I sang, all day long, and I was just everywhere I went. And people would look at me, and I was like, sorry, I didn't realize it. I mean, it was just, it was just there. It was just there. Do we eagerly give Jesus the shirt off our back, but we hold tight? To the things that are going to cost us maybe some time and money. Corey Tinboom once said, The problem with grasping the things of the world too tightly is that when God has to pry our hands loose, it hurts. He wants us to surrender to Him, He wants us to give willingly. He'll put up a lot, maybe with a, a lot of things in our lives, but second place isn't one of them. He wants to be first in our lives. What are we giving to Him? How are we serving Him? Maybe you've eagerly served Jesus, but it doesn't seem like anybody really appreciates it or really notices it. Their little tiny sacrifice thing they did, and you spend hours and do all this big stuff, and they get all this recognition, and you just decide, I've sacrificed and sacrificed, and well, I'm just going to quit serving. Um, Did you hear what I said? He came to serve us by dying on the cross. Who appreciates that? How many times do I take that for granted? You can take your own poll. How many times do we take that for granted? The older brother in the story of the prodigal son, he stayed and did what was right and working hard while his brother headed off. Kind of like sometimes parents scream at their, or teenagers scream at their parents, it's my life and I don't care and I'm going to do what I want to do. You can't tell me what to do. That didn't work out very well for the prodigal and it doesn't usually work out very well for those teenagers. But you know what? That runaway, stubborn, prodigal son came back home, and dad had a party. It was a big party. The old brother, the big brother wasn't happy. He was saying, well, what about me? What about me? What about all the work I've been doing? And did you notice? Did you notice? I mean, we get that way, don't we? And we don't know what the disciples that went to get the colt, they thought, But did you notice in the text, it doesn't say who the disciples were. It just said two went, willingly. And God told them what to do, and they followed, and they came back. And we don't do what we do so that others can be served, just so we get the pat on the back. We do it so others can be served, and Jesus is glorified. The two disciples went. Palm Sunday, the Bible, Palm Sunday was not about those disciples. It was, and it still is, about Jesus. But we miss that. There it is again, missing the significance. Palm Sunday, whoo, next week's Easter. Can you believe how fast we got here? Palm Sunday is about Jesus, and we miss it. It's just another day, and we don't recognize all that's involved in it. And Jesus deserves our glory. It's not about me. It's all about him. This meek, not weak, king, this humble king did not hesitate to suffer hell to pay for your sin and my sin of treating him with contempt. He did it with love and compassion. He knew it was coming, and he went anyway. This almighty king rides to his death. This humble king commands our praise. This is the Palm Sunday paradox. As I said earlier, Christianity is filled with such paradoxes. Most of them centered on the person of Jesus. I want to share this with you. It's called the Christus paradox. You, Lord, are both lamb and shepherd. 
You, Lord, are both prince and slave. You, peacemaker and sword bringer of the way you took and gave. You, the everlasting instant. You, whom we both scorn and crave. Clothed in light upon the mountain, stripped of might upon the cross, shining in eternal glory, beggared by a soldier's toss. You, the everlasting instant. You, who are both gift and cost. You who walk each, side, each day beside us, sit in power at God's side. You who preach a way that's narrow has a love that reaches wide. You the everlasting instant. You who are our pilgrim guide. Worthy is our earthly Jesus. Worthy is our cosmic Christ. Worthy your defeat and victory. Worthy still your peace and strife. You the everlasting instant. You who are our death and life. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You who are our death and life. Think about that. Think about that. Lamb and shepherd, prince and slave, peacemaker, all of those, the, the paradox, all true, all of it. The paradox of Palm Sunday is the paradox of who Jesus is. Triumphal entry, the first step of his journey toward death. As I start thinking about closing this morning, I want you to think about this, crowd, this question. Where are you in the crowd today? If Jesus were to come through these doors on the donkey, where are you today? Oh, you'll shout Hosanna because that's what everybody's supposed to do. And I look around and everybody's doing that. They're praising him. They're shouting Hosanna. They're waving palm branches. They're bowing down before him. They're giving him the blanket. They're, they're, they're giving him whatever he wants outwardly. But what about inwardly? They praised him knowing they were gonna, they're going to line the same path in just a few days and shout, crucify, crucify, crucify. And I do it too. I'm here and I'm here and I sing the praises and I do what I do and I walk out the door and something happens and I think, oh, and I get angry and I don't understand it. Something doesn't go my way with my actions or my voice. So it doesn't go your way, your actions, your voice. Do we shout, crucify him, crucify him? But today we're praising him. So I ask again, have you acknowledged Jesus as Lord of your life? Do you know he's forgiven your sins? Do you know you're going to go to heaven? Most of us say, yes, we do. I do. I, yes. But sometimes we make the confession with our heart, but our hands and our actions are not sure about it. There's not a lot of difference. And so as we think about giving Jesus the best, are we giving him our best? I mean, he gave his life for us. Shouldn't we be giving him at least some of our time and our talent and our tithe to continue to follow his direction and to allow him to use us in ways that other people aren't going to intersect the lives of those that we come in contact with? Maybe your attitude is one of envy or jealousy. It's somebody else is getting here. You feel unappreciated. And, but the, the question, where are you in the crowd? Does Jesus rule your heart today? If you knew your death was coming, would you still go forth? If we knew our death was coming, man, we'd serve him right away. We would be making sure everything is great. If we knew today was our last day, we would live it like it's our last day. We would not even question it. We wouldn't think about it. There would be no two ways to live. We would not be uh, two-faced, if you will, praising and crucifying, praising and we, we would be, it would be congruent. It would be in sync. Today, Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week that leads us to Easter, 
that leads us to the celebration of his death on the cross on Friday and the resurrection of this Christ on Sunday who died for our sins, who went to the grave so you and I don't have to go without knowing the freedom that comes in serving Christ. Does Jesus rule your heart today? How are you serving him? At the heart of Palm Sunday is a path. It's the path our humble king rode in, rode in on in majesty, but it was lowly pomp as he went on to suffer and die for our sins. Palm Sunday is about the path Jesus humbly rides into our hearts today. He's not going to force his way in. We invite him. Just like you invite a friend to come over. You ask, they receive. He's asking, we receive. In Revelation 3.20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door... What's it say? I'm going to come in and I'm going to share a meal with you like friends do because Jesus can be a friend of ours. And when we have relationship with him, he is our friend. He wants to be our father and our friend. And again, we get into all of that and think about it. He stands at the door. He's not going to push his way in. And so this path that Jesus humbly rides to his death, he also wants to ride into our heart today. I'm going to ask Bobby to come, and in just a minute, I'm going to pray a prayer of benediction. But I'm going to pray for you, too. Let me just ask you a couple questions. Just bow your head and close your eyes, and just take a little inventory today. Where are you in the crowd are you in that crowd? Jesus knows. He knew who was going to be in the crowd. What does he see? If you've never asked Jesus to forgive your sins and you want to do that this morning, you, you say, I, I, I need to ask Jesus to come into my heart and forgive my sins. You just put your hand up and down quickly. Just raise your hand. Maybe you're not serving him with your whole heart. You just need to kind of kind of surrender again your whole heart. Maybe you've got a bad attitude. You need to give a little bit more of your time to him. If that's you this morning, just raise your hand. You just you're just not just not fully there. It's not that you haven't been, it's just in this moment, maybe this where you're at right now. Maybe maybe you'd raise your hand and say, you know, I kind of live a double life. When I'm here on Sunday, I'm I'm all good. But when I'm not at church or when I'm not with my church friends, My actions say crucify, crucify. If that's you this morning, raise your hand. As we always do on Sunday, these altars are going to be open. You can come and pray. This is still the Lenten season, giving something up to help us focus on who Jesus is. To focus on the sacrifice of Christ because our little sacrifice is nothing compared to his. But as we think about this beginning of Holy Week, I can't think of a better time to really get my life in order, my heart surrendered, my kingdom of God coming in to my heart. If you want to come and pray, it's not ever, ever, ever too late to surrender to Jesus. Maybe you need to give up your will or your anger and resentment. Something's holding you back from fully recognizing the power of Christ in your life. Maybe you're not able to really see who he is. It's clouded by your circumstance. You've let that push him out. This is Palm Sunday. Don't let it be just another day. Don't let it be just another Sunday. Don't let this week, this holy week, just be another week. I want you to remember the significance of today and the weight, the weight of today in the life of Jesus that takes us to Friday 
and Resurrection Sunday. This, this is one of the most important events in history that changed the path for you and me because he didn't have to go into the city. And he did because it took him to the cross. What's your heart cry this morning? Hosanna, Hosanna, I praise you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I worship you, Lord. I want you to rule my life. Come in and build your kingdom. I surrender everything to you, or is it still, I'm not sure. Still kind of mad. Still don't want you part of my life. Let's stand this morning. If you want to come and pray, please do. Don't leave too soon. No one's going to judge you. No one's going to say, oh, wait, 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 I thought they were a good Christian. Well, you know, we all get tired and we make mistakes and we lose our first love and we become lukewarm. So maybe you just need a kind of a refill this morning. You just need to kind of stop and think about the significance of this day and what Jesus did for you. What are you going to do for him? Give your life to him. Serve him wholeheartedly.